So in order to help understand the kind of approaches we're taking, the questions we're asking, uh, I've got three great speakers uh, to welcome. First is Andy Joseph, uh, then Chris Kurtz, then Eleni um, Kalamara. Uh, so without further ado, Andy, over to you. 20 minutes for the presentation and then 10 minutes for any questions. So I'll wave at you when there's five minutes left. Not see anything. So thanks, Paul, for the introduction. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Nine o'clock on a Friday, the last day, there's a bit of a concern. So um, we talk about cash today. Um, I guess uh, I guess cash has different meaning for different people. So I thought to, to prime people a little bit to do like a thought experiment. So, say, um, imagine you would, we would all lose our jobs today and there would be no, un, like no unemployment benefits. Where would we be looking at? Probably our bank account to kind of keep us afloat. And that's basically um, what I'm talking about today because firms are um, not very different in their behavior probably than where they would look um, to do things, especially in the long term. So that disclaimer, um, I guess applies to, 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 the, uh, to many of us, or all of us in the institutions. I'm not speaking for the Bank of England, but only on behalf of myself. So what, what, what I'm talking about today is a little bit of a shift of, uh, say, thinking and beliefs about uh, corporate cash holdings. So particularly before the crisis, um, cash was seen as something, say, uh, expensive, um, which you generally don't need if you can tap, like, for example, capital markets. And if you have cash, you had, like, pressures to pay your dividends or like pay, pay uh, back uh, earnings to your basically owners of a company. But what we do in this paper here is basically um, document that this uh, um, behavior may not have always been beneficial to companies, particularly uh, um, looking into the long term. And we can see that cash mitigates uh, financial constraints and that you, you may even get like certain competitive dynamics in an industry. So the main question we are answering here or addressing here, the answer is of course always partial in such studies, is how important are cash holding to weather a financial crisis and beyond? And we find that they're very important. So um, I kick off like by going f first through a couple of like stylized facts and then through like the kind of details of the analysis. So first, it's of course an interesting question, uh, how important and, and how worried is cash, where we ca I mean cash is like really bank accounts relative to total assets um, for firms. Is there like enough variation to get like a decent signal here? And is there variation within and between industries? So what, what I've just plotted here on the four digit levels, which is about uh, five, 600 sectors we're looking at. Um, so the mean cash holdings in each industry, which is you can say the very and say on the horizontal axis you see the variation between industry and on the vertical axis you see the variation and um, within e each industry by looking at the standard deviation within that industry and you see there's uh, quite some variation there and this variation I can tell you goes from small to also fairly large uh, firms this means like we can probably expect to have like a large signal here so first some completely non-parametric evidence so say during the crisis um, can we see like a difference between firms who hold high and low cash? And what I'm showing you here on the left hand side is uh, what we define as investment as a change in uh, fixed assets, which is the sum of tangible and intangible assets on the balance sheet. And we look at the difference between the first and the tenth decile just in terms of cash holdings in the firm population. And we see that there is like a sizable difference. Now you may argue maybe well, that's just what, how cash works. But if you look just at, uh, say, this is like an arbitrary time period now selected um, before the financial crisis, and we do the, exactly the same analysis, um, we find basically that cash doesn't really have an impact. I mean, the difference here is not really statistically significant. And if so, it, it's probably the other way around. So now let's take a little bit of, a, again, just completely everything just eyeballing, say, the non-parametric part of the study is um, if you do this more granular and you look at the at, at, at longer time horizons, what I showed you showing you here is uh, centiles of the cash distribution, relative cash distribution here within each industry. Um, so you don't want, so don't look so much on the right hand side what the unit is. I explain later, but just again on the left hand side, uh, the horizontal axis is growth and fixed assets. Um, conditioned just by the coloring if firms had high or low cash going through the crisis. And we see that there's a big dispersion here and there's basically no mixing between this. So there's a clear signal coming from cash here. 
So now you might wonder again, how does this look in a period before the crisis? And you see it looks very, very different. Basically, there's no real difference between firms who have cash on, or not cash, um, and be, because basically everybody kind of keeps investing before the crisis. So, so why now the question is, of course, why should cash holdings matter during a crisis? And, and there's a couple of reasons there. For example, it's a source of internal funds, while external funds may be not available or very costly. It's kind of, um, or oh, it keeps you kind of going, uh, either to, to meet your daily expenses or pay off debt, while others who do not have cash may um, need to engage in fire sales, like mean, uh, um, dispose of assets, for example, to pay off debt. And of course, if you want to invest and have cash, cash is like probably in the crisis, the ultimate collateral you can post to a bank and they would probably give you um, more money. So then, for example, you lead, could imagine during the crisis following the dynamics between two different groups of firms, say cash poor and cash rich firm. It's like cash poor firm may forego investment opportunities and, and liquidate, say, fixed assets, basically reducing the productive um, capacity, uh, while cash rich firms um, continue to operate size opportunities, and you may observe then, for example, a widening uh, investment gaps. And then even so, after the crisis, so if you take the long-term perspective, I mean, again, this is all things which may happen, which we look into more detail in a moment, you may, while, while cash-poor firms um, lost production capacity, and cash-rich firm may have been maybe better place now to um, basically capture returning demand, return investment, and you probably then see certain amplification uh, mechanisms going on on the um, long term. So putting these things together that you can make a couple of predictions here is like, for example, firms of uh, initial means before the crisis relative to rivals high cash holdings may do more long term investments. This, there may be differences between firms which have uh, financially more constraints or less, for example, small firms, young firms, firms with a uh, higher uh, share of uh, intangible assets. Um, and this may play out in certain um, competition dynamics. And just to bring uh, the findings at the beginning, I already, I guess, warmed you up to this, is what we find is that cash-rich firms invest more in the long term and there's a widening um, investment gap after the crisis between cash-rich and cash-poor firm. And this dynamic is very different to like a truncated period say, uh, before the crisis. And this leads to certain market dynamics, and we also find that cash-rich firm actually grab market share. And there's a difference between, say, how you measure uh, uh, between financially constrained and less constrained firms. So, and all of the story is very consistent with uh, uh, credit supply shock, um, um, feed feeding back on investment and market share growth. So what's our empirical methodology? So we lo use... Um, local projections, the model, um, i show you the uh, kind of equation in a moment. This means basically we conditioned on um, cash holdings um, prior to the crisis, and then we run different um, regression analysis going from over a certain horizon, and we basically put them together um, to trace out, um, say, um, as, a point, like as a way of interpreting this, like an impulse response function of the long-term um, effects of saying higher than rival cash holdings on investment and later market share growth and look at difference by cutting data in a different way. So what is our, what is our cash measure, first of all? Cash measure here, we measure relative to rival and it's basically the set score of cash holdings within a four-digit industry, which is basically cash minus industry mean divided by standard deviation. And what's the interpretation of this measure is that, for example, if you have 5% higher cash holding within an industry where you see 2% variation, this may have more strategic value than an industry where you see higher um, uh, variation in cash holdings. And this may also be all be due to industry differences. Um, we have very granular data, as I said, four digits. Um, which is like uh, five, six hundred sectors we're looking at. So, because we want to tell a causal story here, there's of course some, say, what you usually would say identification challenges, is because there may be, say, uh, or, or there probably are in normal times relations going both directions between cash holdings and investment, because you have high cash, you invest, you have invest more, you get more cash, things like this. And we try to address this by saying we fix um, um, cash holdings on like a time before, like a large shock, say, to the economic system, which is then the financial crisis, and we control for, a lot, um, say, certain firm characteristics, um, which proxy for um, performance. 
and we look at um, different cuts of the data. So to say where we say certain, we have, because you have certain expectation when cash may play more of a role or not. For example, financial control will be controlled for, um, say, demand on the industry level by using fixed effects, regional uh, differences, and we control for lacked investment because investment might be lumpy. So what's then the um, final model? Um, what we're looking at is basically we look at, we trace out um, the um, effect of cash, which is like um, on the right hand side, the first variable, and captured by the beta J coefficient, and its effect on uh, lock change of fixed assets between 2007 and horizon J. This means if you go from J from, say, from one to seven, we have seven models, and um, we then compare, so to say, particularly beta coefficients. So what are, our, what are our control variables? It's basically age, size, leverage, um, if a firm is part of a group because there may be internal capital markets, if it's public, uh, pre-crisis investment, turnover, growth, uh, profit, and as I said, on the, on the, on the very right-hand side is, are our industry and regional fixed effects. So I have talked a lot about results and, and models, but what actually is the, the day in terms of the, the interesting part here, especially in this session, the data we're looking at, we basically look at uh, balance sheet data of as as far as possible, um, all um, UK companies available um, um, through their annual accounts. It means we have balance sheet items, cash flow statements, and, and capturing basically the most, say, economic active part of the UK firm population, just like small and medium-sized enterprises and listed firms. But for example, not, not sole traders, because this data is not available for those. And um, the interesting part of this data set, because this type of study is mostly been done only on listed firms, which may have very, very different, um, say, dynamics um, about, for example, events like the financial crisis. So we really capture a lot, and there's actually the majority of our firms are small and medium-sized enterprises. So um, what, what kind of samples do we have? Um, we, we look at, the, I mean, the whole data period is about 15 years, we see 1999 and 2004. We, we, we separate this in two samples. Um, which will be our crisis on a trunkal period um, from 2007 and 2014 and 1 to 7, respectively. We only look at firms active in the respective period because the firm, um, everybody who has worked with firm level data will know that this is like a very, very dynamic um, um, uh, distribution and, 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 and firms not necessarily live, say, very long. And to avoid certain survivorship bias, we really try to concentrate at each sample the, um, uh, it's like, um, the, the maximal amount of firms we can have. We then look at, for example, as you will see, look at different matching mechanisms to be able to compare different samples. And we create, um, also in terms of data availability, different types of uh, samples where some is only basic information about the balance sheet, where we could not control for some stuff. And then we compare this to um, like a full sample where we have everything in terms of cash flow and profits and so on. So now let's basically, um, two kind of quite bare branched charts here, which are, are basically our main findings. And so what you basically can see here is the um, if measured effect of cash on firm investment over a certain horizon of say one, two, three years between one th 2007 and um, 2014. And basically what you can see that is there's a very strong positive relation, and one of the most interesting parts here, that this is growing over time. This means the, um, say, the effect of um, cash on investment really is, uh, is, is, um, is, is like, like, like an amplification mechanism here. So what you basically then can do is, for example, you can compare, um, say, like, make some estimates how big this is, like, what, what can you say about the investment gap? So for example, if I now do, the, again, the same comparison and look at this amplification mechanism between high and low, low cash firms, for example, in 2009 and 14, well, say, it's, again, the inter first and 10th decile range, you see there's a 7% for the post-crisis time and 16% for the whole, whole period in our data set, which is quite a substantial difference here. So now, have we answered? Is cash more valuable during crisis? Not, not really so far because we don't have really like, uh, say, a placebo or benchmark to which to compare it. And that's again, we take our first sample, which is uh, starting in 2000, 
uh, like look at the period 2001 to 2007 and do kind of the same analysis. And as I said, to be kind of precise, we look at the full sample and a matched sample where we match very, very like as granular as possible, say on industry, region, age, size, cash flow, um, a relative cash market share growth. And so say here, this, the results for this type of analysis, again, tracing out the, the uh, beta coefficient for different models over the full time horizon. Now it's like from T equals zero, which is 2000, uh, sorry, 2001 or 2007, and then up to uh, six or seven years. So it's basically the maximum coverage of our data. And what, what we see here is that basically we see some similar pattern of cash on investment, say for the first one or two years, but there's a substantial difference, um, sorry, um, a substantial difference between uh, these two groups. Basically you see in the truncate period, no effect uh, or like no really uh, long-term positive or amplified effect on for, of originally high cash holding on investment. So then we, so we say we have tentatively answered this question, like um, cash is very valuable during and after a financial crisis. And we also see here a difference, which I, I don't go into detail, say between financially more and less constrained firms. How much do I have? Five, very good. Between um, financially more and less constrained firms, we see, say this means we look here particularly at firms which are young or small, which have like either can not tap capital markets or have a harder time getting bank credit in the first place. So let's spend the last time on, um, like the last five minutes on um, competition dynamics. Um, so what we may have we already said before, during a crisis, a cash rich firm may continue investing, potentially sizing assets of cash poor firm, and this may lead to certain um, amplification mechanisms so that um, cash rich firms are then more um, able to capture market share um, during and after a crisis. And say that because they're, for example, better placed to, um, to capture returning demand after the crisis. So what we do now is do exactly the same analysis, but replacing investment with changes in uh, market share. Where market share is here importantly is defined as uh, the assets a firm holds relative to the full digit industry level. You may say that's probably not the best measure. I mean, it, it is the best what our data basically supports because assets is fully covered, while certain turnover measures is only kept, uh, co covered by a s small fraction of firms. Um, again, this, the, the, the rest of the analysis is exactly the same. And what we basically find, we look here at the full and our matched sample, that in terms of market share growth, we see similar but slightly less pronounced dynamics. Then again, the, 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 the green here are our, um, so the effect of cash during the, uh, the crisis on market share, while the, um, the purple is our, the, the kind of comparison to the benchmark. And we basically see oops, oops, that um, cash rich from increased market share, and this effect is again amplified over time. So again, giving some numbers, so um, doing the comparison by we see, say probably for the, um, for the truncate period, we see uh, effect of cash of, you can estimate on say for the full sample between the low and the high decile of like 3% by for the, during the crisis period, the effect of cash is nine point, uh, or nine, a little bit more than 9%, which is again quite large. So now last but not least, um, how does this play out with certain differences among industry and firms? Um, what we look here is um, um, industry differences, and what we do is basically say we divide our firm population. We have in, uh, in between industry, which have an average, say, small or large firms, where we define small or large, the first or the fourth um, um, quartile of the firm population and the same for age and, in, uh, and the intangible asset share in their fixed assets. And then we look, do exactly the same analysis, tracing out the effect of cash holding, initial cash holding in 2006 over the full time horizon. And what you basically see is what you would expect in terms of say if, if, if size and age and the share of intangible assets um, 
of the firm is somehow, for example, proxies for different types of financial constraint, you see that um, smaller firms have a much more sizable benefit from cash, the same for younger firms, and the same, this is particularly probably interesting looking in the way forward, and the same is true for firms with um, higher share of intangible assets. Um, now that's really um, the last bit here. It's, we look at the same in terms of market concentrate, do, we, do we exactly the same uh, uh, um, separation of the population for market concentration, looking at the HHI index, and the depth of the crisis measured uh, in terms of uh, cross-value added in an industry during the crisis and how, how much this has uh, contracted. And what we basically see that um, the effect of cash is stronger. So here it's a less clear where should your prior go, in which direction it should go. So the effect is, uh, is, is of cash is stronger when there's, say, more um, competition, meaning there's less concentration in an industry, and if it is less affected prior, by a crisis. So to say, if you see complete uh, havoc during the crisis, probably even cash wouldn't save you. And if this, I say, Thanks a lot, and um, say one of the main messages I want to bring across here, there had been a lot of, say, focus on, say, the um, liability side of um, firm's balance sheet, and um, we try to bring here more focus on the asset side, particularly liquid assets like cash, and see that it's a very important uh, determinant of long-term growth after a financial crisis. Thanks a lot. Thanks very much, Andy. Oh, fall down. Uh, We've got a bit of time for any questions. We've got microphones, I think. Um, so there's a gentleman at the top. UK's had a relatively weak productivity performance relative to other countries. Have you been able to look at this internationally to see whether there's any evidence that UK firms had poorer cash holdings than their international peers? Uh, sure. one, one question or several question at the... Oh, okay, yeah, so I do one-on-one. Uh, on one. Um, so we can't do... Um, we were trying to look into this, but I must say we didn't find the exact matching cash data for other countries, so we, we have been thinking of this. The same database exists on, a national, uh, on an international level, European and um, uh, global level, but. We, we, we don't have it available, so I must say that's a, that's a very interesting point. We have been thinking, trying to look in it, but we couldn't couldn't do it. Questions? Actually, can I ask one? Sure, sure, sure. Um, so there are, there are two reasons, it seems to me, that uh, you might get this result. One is that uh, banks and other credit institutions aren't lending to anyone. Mm -hmm. So if you've got more cash, you've actually got something you can spend. Yeah. And the other is that they're using it as a filtering signal so they see the companies with cash and they think that they are just a better credit risk. Do you have any kind of evidence for which one is, is more important? Um, I, I think part of the story we mentioned is, is, is both, so to say. But um, I, I must again say, I mean, on the second, there had been some evidence that there is a relation of, say, say certain firm bank relation play a role during the crisis. But again, um, I would say there's a little bit of a limitation here because we, do, we can't make a relation between um, firms and banks in our data set. So this may say be different, difficult for us to differentiate. Again, but I, I, I say that both mechanisms are likely playing a role yeah. here. I mean, one thing you could do is to you just use the cash holdings at the level of cash holdings mm -hmm. at the beginning of the period. You might also look at the growth rate of cash holdings in the period up to the beginning of the crisis yeah. as a kind of indicator about whether companies, uh, some companies are actually seeing the bad times ahead and are therefore yeah. kind of better set up to weather the crisis. So, so one thing it was, I mean, because particularly the second point, uh, say maybe a concern for our analysis. We um, thought conditioned um, on cash relatively early to the crisis, and one of the key assumptions of the study is that firms didn't see it coming, at least in 2006, maybe in 2007. But um, again, I think a very good point. Okay. George. Actually, can you just wait for the microphone, sorry.
Do you have data on other liquid assets, bonds and so on? And if so, would that make a difference? So um, we have, I mean, so the other liquid assets would be in the other current assets. So cash is part of the current assets um, and in, on the balance sheet. What we have is um, um, there particularly something called other current assets, which is like a, like a jumble of many other different things, particularly, I mean, what we were particularly interested is in things like short term, like more liquid investment holdings. Um, but again, the, the problem here was we have an extremely low coverage in our data. That's why we uh, are like on this kind type of assets because firms are basically not required to report it, particularly small and medium sized ones. And, and then again, we decided not, not to do it. But we, we, we assume or presume that there would probably some similar mechanism going on. a bit on Paul's question, but do you think you could, do you have enough data to do this relative cash holdings within the firm? So then your kind of mean and standard deviation would be that firm's behavior over time. What do you mean within the firm? So instead of doing uh, the firm's cash holdings relative to the industry, mm -hmm. uh, you would do the firm's cash holdings relative to its historical average and standard deviation. Yes, I mean that's something we. I mean, at least for the crisis period, we can 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 look into it. So it's, I think it's a good good suggestion. Okay, um, brilliant. Thank you very much, Andrew. Thanks a lot. So next up is Chris Kurtz from uh, the Fed Board of Governors, flown all the way from Washington to speak to us here. Uh, so Chris. So I'll just give a little bit of history for this project first and then um, kind of delve into some of the details. But uh, I mean, this project really has been uh, one that has moved from sort of forming a relationship with a private company to actually trying to produce and, and, and reaching that goal, producing an indicator that we use internally um, at the board to help uh, facilitate our understanding of what's happening in the labor market. I think there's uh, two ways to think about having alternative data sources in some cases. Uh, one would be to sort of replace uh, or allow you to forecast, uh, let's say, the indicator of interest. And another would be to say, well, we don't just have this new uh, set of information for which we can better understand the economy. We should take that information and combine it with kind of our current uh, metrics that we have for, say, employment or output or consumer spending. And so that's sort of going to be the direction we go to with this paper, which is really you know, less uh, pushing in the direction of actually able being to do a better job of forecasting what employment's going to be and better uh, and more in the direction of trying to get a better understanding of what, let's say, the true state of employment is. Um, in some cases, I think uh, the, the nomenclature we use, the kind of language that we employ in this project is, is is slightly stressed due to the fact that I think in some cases we don't really want to think of what we estimate and what we measure as, say, like a pooled state or an underlying state uh, or a true state. We just don't have the right terminology for that. So, so what do I mean by this? Well, uh, what we're essentially doing is we're going to say, how can you, you know, lay out a, a roadmap for how you can combine official and alternative data to improve, let's say, the accuracy of economic measurement? Um, our case here is going to be in terms of uh, payroll employment data. What do I mean by payroll employment data? There's essentially two sets of labor information in the U.S. that get released monthly, pretty much on the first Friday of a particular month for the preceding month. One is a household survey. Uh, that's not going to be the focus of this paper. And the other is an establishment survey. An establishment survey essentially releases the job gains for a particular month. Uh, and again, that's released on the first Friday of the month. Uh, that data is based on a collection that takes place around the payroll period of the 12th of the month, so the middle of the month. Uh, it's one of the most important economic indicators we have. 
Uh, it's probably the best economic indicator to understand the cyclical state of the economy. Um, the average gains that we've been seeing over the past few years has been about 200,000 jobs a month. Uh, the standard deviation is about 60,000. Uh, importantly, and where I'm going to be going with this, is that the standard error on those estimates uh, is about 65,000. The 90 percent confidence interval for the monthly job gains is about 110,000. So that's a really important point to take away, is that we might have uh, great data that's produced at a high frequency that's highly, uh, let's say, has a high beta with other things in the economy. But at the same time, um, if it's the case that your standard error is about 110, or uh, uh, if your 90 percent confidence interval is about 110,000, as, let's say, job gains begin to slow, you really have to worry about what's the proper signal you should be taking from, from that data. Um, and uh, the sample that's used to create this, this monthly release is about 20% of all payroll employment. And that number is going to be important uh, in a minute as we talk more about the alternative data that we're going to be sort of augmenting uh, the, the official BLS CES data with. So what are we going to be doing is we're going to first, we're going to build our own uh, index or actually own employment job numbers from this alternative data source, which we're going to call ADP FRB. We're going to compare that to the official data source. Uh, we're also going to talk about how we benchmark that information. And then we're going to use it in some forecasting exercises and come to the conclusion that uh, probably in a world in which you have such a large confidence interval around the monthly job numbers, you probably want to think about it as more as a, a complement to what's produced officially than actually a substitute or some kind of tool you could use to do better forecasting. And I think sort of an underlying theme with a lot of the discussions you've been seeing over the past few days is that um, the information that we might get from alternative data sources doesn't necessarily provide a substitute for official statistics. And actually, in a way, those official statistics are, are meaningful and necessary to, to understand these, these new data sources. So the current uh, employment statistics and the quarterly census of employment and wages are important parts of our utilizing this, this alternative data. So in no way do we think of this as a way of, 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 of replacing um, official data. Our data is based on payroll records from 1999 until the present time period, uh, similar to the actual sample frame that's used by uh, the BLS. Um, we have about 20% of the total workforce. Um, we're thinking about private payroll employment, so we're excluding like government workers. Um, one large difference between the uh, publicly produced data and the data that we're employing here is that we actually have weekly snapshots of payroll employment as opposed to, let's say, just focusing on a survey week. That's important when you think about things like, let's say, the effects of a weather event or some type of work stoppage. You'll actually, as you have every week of the month, you can think of averaging through the employment of the month as opposed to the BLS, which focuses on an individual week. Um, we then process that information and aggregate it into uh, uh, official, uh, let's say, uh, our sort of ADP FRB index of private employment. Um, and an important kind of counterpoint here is the information we're doing uh, and we're compiling uh, is not what you see when uh, ADP publishes their national employment report. This is a kind of a completely separate framework. We're actually using the underlying microdata to, to come up with a measure of employment. Uh, it's not necessarily the model uh, that's produced, let's say, by Moody's for ADP. The strengths and weaknesses of our data, again, uh, we're, reserving, we're observing all pay periods. Um, this is not a, a specific probability sample, but it's pro approximately representative. Uh, and what do I mean by that? Well, it doesn't have the sort of idea behind the stratified samples that the BLS puts together. At the same time, sort of just like in basic employment shares that, uh, so I have ADP, the ADP data is in the red, um, the CES uh, sample is in blue, and then the black uh, bars are going to represent the population, which is taken from the QCEW. Uh, and you'll see it essentially, it's pretty representative, over-representative in manufacturing. Another way to think about this is in terms of pay frequency. Again, um, it's pretty representative in terms of pay frequency. And then when you think about it in terms of census region, uh, we'll see that it's actually a little bit more representative than Northeast. That's just a historical uh, kind of artifact of the fact that that's where the pay private payroll provider is actually located. So they probably have more clients in that individual region. Another, I think, 
set that I don't have here is the size distribution. Uh, so just bear with me. If you're thinking about like a cumulative distribution function of the survey data, uh, that's the monthly data that's produced, the population uh, data, that's the official population of firm size across the entire country, and the um, ADP micro data, we'll find that while the two samples are comparative between what's put into the monthly survey data and our ADP FRB numbers, we're much more representative of the whole country prior to, let's say, a re-weighting. So approximately representative, uh, and then I think another real strong point here is that essentially we're getting weekly updates. Uh, there is not, um, as far as I know, a weekly measure of employment in existence, uh, which I think gives us sort of a leg up on understanding what's happening within a current month. At the same time, I think thinking about employment in a month at a weekly frequency is also extremely difficult because the decisions that are made, let's say, uh, by employers um, aren't necessarily things that are happening at a very high frequency. Um, one interesting aspect, I think, particularly relative to some of the work that the ONS was doing to produce their own type of uh, LBD, was that when you think about how firms change on their margin of employment, well, with weekly data, you're really able to get a fine look at how firms are hiring or firing. In our case, I would say it's more like establishments are adding or subtracting employment over time. And our traditional ideas about whether or not firms are growing or shrinking are typically uh, let's say captured at an annual frequency or a quarterly frequency, and once you start looking at, let's say, like a weekly frequency, you'll see that in a lot of cases, uh, organizations, let's say, will have constant employment over quarters, but within those quarters, there's a lot of small employment changes, which then lead back to, let's say, a specific threshold for employment. Uh, what I mean by that is a firm might want to have 50 people within a year, they move down to 40 and then come back up to 50. And so if you're checking out sort of how employment dynamics change over time, it would look like uh, an establishment or a firm actually has constant employment over that time period. But within that, uh, let's say, frequency, you're going to see lots of small employment changes. So let's uh, throw up um, a graph of both the official uh, BLS CES data, the red line, and then a blue line, which is going to be sort of our ADP FRB data, which is not benchmarked. So we do some additional changes before we take a, kind of like taking a signal from this uh, about employment. These are entirely different concepts in some ways when you think about the monthly wiggles. But it's important to note that uh, first off, they 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 basically uh, capture uh, business cycle movements very well. Um, so, so it's sort of this business cycle frequency. They're very highly correlated. At the same time, you'll see that the month-to-month -month changes aren't, uh, which raises the question about which one is right. Uh, and, and, and kind of in the back of your mind, you should think of, well, if it's the case that I'm telling you that the uh, uh, officially produced statistics typically have a, a confidence interval around of about 110,000, then we don't really know which one is actually right, uh, which will lead us to kind of our conclusion in a bit, which is probably the best approach would be to take the signal from both of these time, time series. So let's do a little bit of comparisons in terms of, let's, uh, in terms of which, uh, what we can do with the data. And this is just comparing the CES and the ADP FRB microdata uh, in, in different kind of in different types of, of, of metrics. And the first one would be, let's think about sort of the benchmark revisions. Uh, once a year, the official statistics get benchmarked with the QCEW data, so it hits sort of this target growth rate. Um, and then there's sort of this linear wedge that's put in to make the two uh, match, let's say, over time. So there's an annual benchmarking process, uh, which adds sort of this constant to the entire series. And then uh, given that you can benchmark the official data, we can benchmark this, uh, the ADP FRB series. We'll see that uh, the root mean squared error, the benchmark, is a lot smaller for the CES data uh, relative to the ADP data. Another way of thinking about those benchmarks is like, um, which has the smaller or larger benchmark revision. Uh, one way that we've done that is essentially just plot um, sort of the benchmark revisions, so the top um, Row is going to be the ADP FRB benchmark revision. So this is the magnitude of employment revisions that you'd see. Uh, the second row is going to be the benchmark revisions for the CES. Uh, and the third is going to be what we call the CES benchmark revisions without the birth death model. And so what do I mean by that? Well, in the background, uh, the official statistics that are produced from this sampling methodology technically don't have, don't actively capture 
at a high frequency, births and deaths of establishments or a UI uh, codes as, as we would measure them. Um, so what's, in the what's running in the background of those monthly job numbers is something called the birth death model, which tries to account for births and deaths uh, of businesses through the business cycle. And you'll see that that actually contributes a lot. Uh, this ARIMA process that they use to estimate births and deaths contributes a lot to how um, close the official statistics actually get to the benchmark data. I mean, it is what it is. There's nothing you can do about not being able to pick up uh, births and deaths in near real, real time, but it's an important thing to keep uh, in the back of your mind. Um, given that information, we'd say that four out of 10 years, the ADP FRB, so almost half the time, we actually have a smaller benchmark. But given this idea about having sort of this ARIMA process working behind the production of monthly job numbers, you can see that what that's going to do is that's going to add some inertia, some momentum to your numbers that you might not accurately, let's say, pick up some type of turning point. Um, and so when we think about where some of the large revisions took place in the official statistics relative to our measure, it's exactly then during the Great Recession. Um, one way of looking at that is we have this Great Recession real-time chart, uh, which shows um, it's basically a spaghetti chart, but um, so uh, the CES final is the dark blue line. So those are the numbers that if you looked up the employment numbers at the time of the Great Recession, it wouldn't look like the blue line. It would look like the red lines. Um, so if you compare sort of the black uh, lines with the thin red lines, you'll see that these are two the kind of real-time comparisons. And the ADP FRB numbers do a much better job of explaining the depth of the recession uh, in real time uh, as opposed to the officially published numbers, and it's much closer to, let's say, the thick blue line. Um, so there is a different type of signal, and, and partly that's probably due to the fact that uh, the administrative data that's being pulled in here it does a much better job of picking up, let's say, exits from, from the sample. We do some annual regressions to kind of test this uh, in terms of saying, well, how does it do in terms of predicting the benchmark? Uh, the CES data outperform the ADP FRB data. We think that's primarily, again, due to this birth death adjustment. Um, another way of thinking about this information, aside from trying to get the true level of employment, which I'm doing in the first part here, would be to evaluate the ADP FRB data and see which whether uh, you can predict the final print of the monthly CES data. Uh, again, this kind of goes back to my earlier point, is that if, if, you're, if your job really is to understand and try to predict uh, what the monthly numbers are, we should at least be able to see what kind of forecasting power these series have. Um, it's the case that the ADP FRB data are statistically significant for predicting final CES data. And this is the final print. It's not the first print. Uh, and I think an important aspect of this, which is counters to some preliminary or previous studies, would be that um, even in the situation in which you have market expectations in hand, it's still useful to have this alternative indicator. So I think in, in the best thing to do would be just look at that first top row and see that in each case, uh, regardless of whether or not you have employment expectations, you'll see that, um, I'll just walk over here, that the, so the, these two columns, three and four, show you that um, with and without expectations, the addition of this ADP FRB series is important in terms of predicting final payroll employment. And then I think um, very interesting, uh, you can see that actually when you have that first print of data in hand, so let's say you just have that first print of the monthly job numbers in hand, is it still useful to have um, our own, let's say, uh, uh, processed uh, independent read of employment that comes from uh, the ADP FRB series, and you'll see that it's still important to have that in hand because that helps you predict what the final revision is going to be. So even once you have that first print of the monthly job numbers, it's important to have this in your back pocket because it'll help you understand which way the revisions are going to go as, um, as additional, let's say, data points come in. Uh, at the same time, it's really tough to think about how you're actually going to be able to decrease the root mean squared errors of these forecasts, which then brings us back to the first point, is that technically, if, you're actually ex if, you, if you live in a world in which your standard error for the uh, officially produced statistics is 65,000, you know, that's your bound. You can't get much below the bound of standard error that's actual in the official uh, statistics. So you know, maybe the idea shouldn't be the case that we should try to better forecast, given that there's always going to be an error around this official statistics. Uh, we should probably take this into a different direction. Um, and again, kind of touching on my issue uh, discussion earlier about some of the uh, uh, um, bumping into, let's say, the bounds of the standard error, 
Uh, there's other uh, sources of error um, in the officially produced statistics that we haven't even addressed. And, and an important aspect of this is I said that there's about 20% sample for the overall US, let's say, private non-farm employment uh, that's put into the monthly official, officially produced statistics. Uh, that doesn't take into account the fact that there's a substantial amount of non-response. Uh, so uh, I think it's about 70% of those that are actually surveyed respond, and that's not something that's taken into account when they actually give that confidence interval. Um, there's also this reference per uh, period concept, which is the idea that you should hit you know, the survey week, which might add additional error. This is birth death adjustment that's hiding in the background. Um, and uh, not mentioned here, but you're also going to see that there's a lot of concurrent seasonal adjustment going on. So there's lots of reasons for why you should actually have a wider confidence interval around that, that monthly point estimate. Uh, and we think about all these issues as adding up to, a, to this sort of conclusion, which is, well, maybe we shouldn't be thinking about this in terms of forecasting, because we're never going to get that much better than the standard error. In addition to these other issues, we should think about combining the information from the officially produced data with the data that we have to see if we can come up with a better estimate of, let's say, this true um, measure of employment in a state space framework. Essentially, just throw this through a common filter model. We think if there's this true unobserved state of employment, uh, what we call true employment growth, so that's essentially an AR process. Um, this is uh, the assumption of the type of process is, is largely irrelevant in terms of our results. Uh, we get the CES and ADP FRB series are, are noisy indicators of truth. Uh, we extract estimates of the observation noise and then extract what we think of as true employment growth, which I have plotted here in the black line, and the gray shaded area would be our confidence interval around that. Uh, essentially, what we're doing, in a way, would be to think about your averaging the signal that you get from both of these information sources. Uh, interestingly enough, if you actually kind of take uh, if you use like the Kalman gain as a measure uh, of these two series, or if you actually kind of extract that true series and see, you know, calculate the weights on the ADP FRB series and the uh, CES series, you'll find out that both get about equal weights. So as we come up with this true state of employment, uh, the ADP FRB series and the monthly jobs numbers that come out of the BLS are, are given equal weights, which we think says, uh, goes back to that original point of mine, which is that we should probably combine these two sources of information, and they're both about equally valuable, and that makes sense since both are about 20% of the overall economy. Um, so, so that's kind of the first point on this slide. It's, it's robust to changes in assumptions. Like I said, it doesn't have to be an AR1. It could be a random walk. We can correlate the observation noise. Um, the other employment series that I mentioned at the beginning of this, this sort of household survey data that's produced also by the BLS, which is typically used to give us the unemployment rate, uh, if you add the CPS series instead of the ADP FRB series, that gets about a 5% weight. So just as a comparison point between these two series which get equal weight, uh, the CES data uh, and the CPS data has about 95 5% weights. So then sort of the last kind of uh, uh, you know, result that we have in this, in this part of this research project is really, well, you, you think of this state as being an important, let's say, indicator that can be used in policy discussions, right? You see a really weak uh, uh, officially produced number, you can say, well, the, the, the alternative data source, when you average these two together, will give us a different, uh, a different idea of what actual employment is for a month. Maybe there was a weather event, uh, maybe there was a bad survey week, maybe there was a lot of non-response. So it helps you kind of filter through the actual produced information. Uh, one way of actually trying to, to test this idea is that we actually create a forecasting regression in which we use the state space estimate to predict either the next month's CES numbers or, let's say, the next three months of CES numbers. And in both of those situations, the combined state of the CES and ADP FRB series outperforms any other measure. So this kind of this state space estimate, this true, let's say, series of employment, does a really good job, uh, better than CES or ADP FRB in a horse race, to understand, let's say, the next three months uh, average growth rate, which would be a best kind of way of thinking about where employment is going to be uh, in the near term. So to conclude, um, alternative data can improve the accuracy of payroll employment estimates. Uh, the ADP FRB data contains similar amount of information as the CES data, as evident by sort of these common weights I talked about. And um, 
we believe moving forward, and part of our, our, our approach would be to think about ways in, in working with the uh, official statistical agencies to kind of utilize data from payroll processors to increase sample size at no cost, which I think is a, a, a possible direction forward given um, what we're seeing, uh, particularly in terms of, let's say, non-response. Um, that's all I've got. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, questions? Gentleman up there. Thanks very much for the presentation. Um, I wondered, do you know, is there much overlap between the samples, between the two, uh, the two surveys you've looked at? So are some are in both the ADP data as, as well as the other? And if there is, can you find out whether the behavior the information that comes out the way you've used it through ADP is different to how it comes out through the official series? So that's, that's the million dollar question. Uh, and I think it's a really, it's the, it's, it has to be the next kind of direction of this project. Uh, so we have done some kind of back of the envelope calculations about how much sort of the sampling error will be reduced uh, if you kind of think about perfect overlap. Um, sort of mutually exclusive data series, and it's always about 20 to 30 percent. Um, but so we are trying to have discussions or starting discussions to sort of bring these two data sources together. Uh, I think it, it's, it's going to be an extremely difficult project due to sort of confidentiality issues on both sides. But uh, understanding the overlap, understanding how those responses might be different, uh, and being able to come up with sort of this true merge data that doesn't have any overlap uh, would be sort of an ideal outcome here, and that would require us dealing more with the BLS and more with ADP, but that's a direction that we're trying to go in. Other questions? Can I abuse my role as chair and ask you one? Um, so when you have a kind of cataclysmic recession, as we've had uh, in the crisis period, it's kind of a blessing and a curse in a way from a research perspective. So it's a blessing in the sense that that's when you want uh, information is just more valuable. The policymakers need to respond more quickly, et cetera. Um, but the curse is it can completely dominate the results. So if you look at your charts, a lot of them basically look like a kind of a, a lot of randomness, basically a straight line and a huge mm -hmm. fall, then a huge rise, then another straight line. Mm -hmm. To what extent do you think these results are really just being completely driven by the crisis period. So we do so we do exclude that in our results. Um, I think again like when you actually look at the the month to month uh, correlations are about 10% uh, outside of the great recession time period. Um, but I think this kind of goes back to the point that we don't really know which you know which is the actual correct month to month change. I think kind of the best kind of best way around that is like when we do the three month uh, average and then predict that with the state uh, that yeah. kind of shows us that as you kind of smooth through those month to month changes. But you're right, like this is dominated by the Great Recession, uh, but it's not that all the results are. Sure. Um, Brilliant. Jeremy at the top. Thanks, Chris. Um, just a kind of um, practical question. Do you, do you find this kind of any, can you produce the ADP data in a really timely fashion? Um, and have you got any plans to kind of, or are you publishing this stuff alongside the CES stuff? And how, how is that? Yeah, if you did that, would you get any reaction from this, you know, kind of either positive or negative? So, um, In terms of the first question, so we essentially have, as we move through the month, and, and the, the way we present this information is dated in a way, so we don't kind of have the most recent months in it just for kind of like internal reasons. Um, but um, we have this, we have an estimate of this information usually two to three weeks into the month uh, for a given month. So I think that timeliness aspect is really important um, in terms of actually trying to have an idea of what um, is happening uh, for a given month of employment. And I think in a lot of cases, you have to think about this in, in the context of sort of like um, the sort of 
the decisions that are made on a monetary policy basis are typically made with lagged information. Uh, in some cases, that information is extremely stale. Uh, so just being able to have an employment report uh, when you don't have one for, let's say, an FOMC meeting is really valuable. So we basically, we process data weekly. Um, typically, it takes about three weeks of the month, uh, which is four, so the way we define it is uh, four weeks of payroll data equals three weeks of employment data. We assume there's a lag of one week. Uh, so, but about uh, four weeks into the month, we'll have an estimate that we feel pretty confident of. Uh, in terms of being able to provide this information publicly, I mean, that's something we have to think about. I mean, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of human capital in this project, and it's not necessary, that should not be something that kind of hinders the ability to kind of provide this information for the, for the, for the public good. I mean, part of me might say that the fact that it's being used by uh, the board to, to help understand the current state of employment is for the, for the greater good, but I think kind of moving forward, thinking about ways of, of, of disseminating this, or at least the process more broadly. Um, and that's, and that's kind of touches on the first question, which is, you know, let's get this, let's get these two different data sources together to understand kind of how they complement each other at a better, at a micro level. Okay, uh, if there are no more questions. On to Eleni. So Eleni Calamaris, uh, you're on home ground <laughs> uh, from King's College. Um, so it's difficult, I'd say, to overstate how important and how difficult uncertainty uh, has been to thinking about what's been going on in the economy over the past decade or so. So this is a particularly interesting presentation, I think. So um, you have to excuse me about my voice today. It's not very helpful with me. Uh, so, good morning everyone. This is uh, a joint project uh, with uh, George Capetanos, Arthur Charles, Suzit Kapadia and uh, Chris Redl. And as the title of this paper suggests, we study whether we can extract any measure of sentiment and uncertainty out of text. So, before I, I proceed, uh, further proceed analyzing our work, I'll try to give you a bit of motivation why actually our work is interesting and why it actually um, really worth looking on this kind of new source of data. So sentiment and uncertainty, there are two of many elements that shape human behavior. This has been stressed a long time ago by Keynes' animal spirits. And in fact, there are real world examples and empirical evidence that show that these um, components uh, are present in the economy and they do really matter for the economic affairs. However, they're both unobservable components and therefore there are kind of different ways to measure them. So this is basically where text comes to the scene. So potentially by looking into information that can affect human behavior and human decisions and contained in uh, popular narratives such as newspaper al articles could be one way to, ap to approach um, this source of, inf of, of information. Uh, but what are really the benefits of looking uh, into text? So temps, text comes with many benefits. One of them is that we can have gains in timeliness. We can construct uh, text-based indicators on a per article ba basis, and then we can aggregate them on a monthly, um, weekly frequency and so on. Of course, if this new source of data proves that holds real information about the economic environment, it could be nicely function as another alternative of the soft data, such as consumer confidence indices that have been uh, widely used in the literature so far uh, to proxy this kind of notions. Um, so all these facts led us to ask the question, which text metrics and which text sources actually are, could be used as uh, alternative indicators of sentiment and ascendancy? And for that reason, we ran a horse race of different text, source, text metrics um, and, to, in a, in, in, and to several text sources. <coughs> so, and as a matter of fact, let's have a look uh, on the, our dis descriptive statistics data. So, we collect newspaper articles from three highly circulating newspapers, uh, namely The Guardian, The Daily Mirror, The Daily Mail. We've got about half a million articles. Good news here is that we can actually control for, for the nature of the articles, meaning that we only include the articles that, um, that um, are economic articles, financial articles, uh, 
some political, uh, uh, some political uh, pieces, and we exclude information that could uh, potentially bias our results, such as uh, sport articles. Um, also, the archive for The Guardian and The Daily Mail goes back to 1990s, whereas for The Daily Mirror goes back to 1995, and all of them, uh, all, uh, and the data set stops uh, in June 2018. So once we have our data, how we really end up turning text into time series? How, how from a raw text, uh, we end up having some um, text indicators? So we call them algorithm-based metrics, the first approach. Um, these are three different kind of uh, text analysis methods that have been used so far in the literature. Uh, I'm not going to talk uh, for each one uh, separately, but broadly speaking, we've got three different categories. Uh, the first one is a dictionary-based approach, which is also uh, the most common used in the literature, uh, where you essentially have a, dis a predefined dictionary with positive and negative works, and you can create a score sentiment, uh, taking just the differences and applying some sort of standardization. Uh, also, the Bill Boolean one is the one uh, where you measure the number of articles that uh, satisfy some logical expressions, and also the economic policy, policy uncertainty in the index, um, which is a, of, of Baker's, is uh, fall, also falls into this category. Uh, and we also included some um, computer-based uh, methods, text analysis methods, because text analysis originates from the computer science-based literature. For example, uh, the VADA sentiment there is just a measure that uses text summarization techniques to construct um, the sentiment uh, of an article. Um, so here is making text count in, in practice, I would say. So here is just imagine that each of these paragraphs um, is an article. We can see how the different metrics can capture the different tone contained in, in each of these uh, paragraphs. So for example, if you have a look uh, on the Alexopoulos 0.9 there, uh, which is actually the first uh, paper that, create, that created uh, uncertainty indices out of text, you can see that it takes only the score one, only when it finds uh, an article using, uh, with the word economy and uncertainty. Uh, for the sentiment metrics, probably the best example is to have a, to focus on these two sentences here. So the first one says, the current direction of policy is very bad, uh, which is a clearly negative uh, sentence. And uh, whereas the second one says that the current direction of policy is very good, which gives uh, a, a positive message. And we can see how this it translates to each of these metrics here and how this uh, change the score accordingly. So once we create our, our text series, a plausible question uh, is whether actually these metrics are suitable for modeling. So for that reason, uh, we check for stationarity and uh, we apply a simple IDK Fuller test and we found that actually uh, these measures um, seem to be stationary, most of them at 1% significance level. Uh, and now on a further step, we ask whether these metrics look plausible comparing to other metrics uh, of sentiment and ascendancy, which are not text-based. And for that reason, uh, we collect a large set of soft data and hard data, such as consumer confidence indices, uh, volatility indices that have been used um, in the literature so far uh, to proxy this kind of, um, of ideas. Uh, to give you an example here, this is a pool of the data that we've used. We can see that we include PMI, business optimism, and for the ascendancy ones, uh, we've got <coughs> some volatility index indices, some financial uh, stress indices. So we run a, uh, a series of validation tests. We run a graded causality test. The results are, uh, seem to be mixed, but most of the metrics seem to grade the course at least one of the progs at three month horizon. And as another thing to note here is that when we create unified series across, um, across the, the newspapers, we use some weights which are the proportional uh, <coughs> according to the reach. And by reach, uh, we mean the share of the population that reports where they get their news from. Uh, and this has been suggested by Kenny and Brandt. <coughs> So let's proceed now to some visual evidence of the correlations. So 
This is a swath plot from the min to max of, of, for the sentiment uh, using the Daily Mirror newspaper. We can see here um, that this is the proxy of, of, a, of sentiment using the soft data, and the blue line here denotes uh, the text-based sentiment. We can see that it depicts striking, uh, at least qualita qualitatively, uh, correlation with, uh, with the proxies of sentiment. Uh, and they basically follow the same, pa the, the same pattern um, and can really pick up the crisis on, uh, uh, on 2007. Uh, this is the picture for ascendancy. I would say that again here, this is uh, the blue line denotes the ascendancy of the text based ascendancy, whereas um, the <clears throat> the brown line denotes uh, the text-based, uh, the, the, the non-text-based uh, uncertainty. Um, <clears throat> it can, uh, I would say here that it, it corresponds mainly to the UK case, meaning that we may not really pick up the crisis here on 2008. However, it uncertain uh, text-based uncertainty spikes uh, on events that they were important for the UK, such as uh, the Brexit referendum or the general election in 2015. And now uh, let's proceed with some quantitative evidence of the correlation with proxies. So we plot the heat maps of our, of our metrics uh, with regard to the proxies of sentiment after three months. Uh, we can see that the purple the, the purple uh, color denotes positive correlation, whereas uh, the green color denotes uh, negative correlations. We can see that most of our metrics remain uh, strongly correlative even after three month horizon with a, with a, with a proxies of uh, sentiment. This is for the ascendancy one, the, the heat maps for the ascendancy metrics. The picture here is less impressive, meaning that we have some negative correlations with the uh, proxies of uncertainty. Uh, however, there are, they, there do still exist some positive correlations and uh, the uncertainty metrics seem to be mostly correlated with the economic policy uncertainty of baker, the baker, bakers. And it's not um, surprising, given that it is also text-based major as well. And now we proceed to the second part of the exercise. So now uh, once we are confident that these metrics uh, hold some information about the economy and seem to be uh, correlated with other soft data, we try to see if they can actually help us improve macro and financial forecasting. So we try to, so for, for that reason, we set up a very simple forecast environment. Uh, we, we, do some to, we do kind of different uh, forecasting exercises using a rolling window. Um, we going, we're going to, I'm going to present some results at the six month horizon. Um, <clears throat> we are looking on the out of some relations of, of, of the text-based measure, which is uh, a text-based measure including um, the single text indicator uh, over a, a different benchmark. So every ratio which is uh, greater than one indicates a negative performance, whereas uh, any ratio it, which is less than one gives us some forecast gains by including this text indicator. Uh, we also test this in a, in, in, a, in a pool of targets. So for example, to give you an idea, we use most of them that are real economy variables, such as the unemployment rate, the inflation, uh, and we also include two financial indices, such as the financial stress index um, and the financial condition index of IMF. <coughs> So the first exercise is, is a simple model, is an AR1 model, which is a very simple model, but still remains difficult to, to, to beat in the literature. And this text metric based model is the AR1, the AR1 including a single text indicator. Uh, for quarterly variables, we adopt um, a kind of mixed data samples technique, meaning that we also include uh, the three months um, of the quarter uh, to, to forecast uh, the relative, for the, the relative for uh, quarter. 
And this is just um, a visual uh, a visualization of, of the forecast. So this is the forecasting and employment using an AR1. The AR1 is on the left hand on the left hand side, and we can see that by including only uh, for example, the TFIDF economy, which is basically uh, the raw counts of the world economy, um, how it impro improves the goodness of it uh, and the out of sum root mean square error from 0 .4, uh, 0 0.45 um, goes down to 0 0.39. And we can see how actually this depicted, especially during the, the financial crisis period, which uh, improves the, uh, the forecast. And here is all the focus acro acro uh, across all our uh, horizons. So two things to pick up from here is that we do better on the unemployment rate, the inflation rate, and the index of services. And act actually, the sentiment metrics are the ones that help us improve the forecast rather than the ascendancy ones. Uh, again, um, the y-axis here uh, are always the ratio. So everything that is less than one indicates a positive uh, forecasting performance. Um, <clears throat> here, we, uh, in order to verify uh, the forecasting gains, uh, we also do, um, inc we, we also perform a Diable and Mariano test for forecast accu accuracy, and we actually find that our um, findings uh, are statistically significant. Now we proceed on the second exercise, uh, on a second forecast exercise. So now we change the benchmark essentially. We, we keep the lags of the AR1, and we, but we also include some uh, macro factors. And again, the text, me text metric based model is the base model with an addition of the single text indicators. Again, for the quarterly, quarter, uh, quarterly targets, um, we, uh, again, we include the th relative three months uh, of the forecast to be forecasted. And in the interest of, of time here, I'm gonna, uh, I will show you only the double Mariano test, but um, basically the, re the results suggest that align with the previous exercises, meaning that we all ha still have significant results for the inflation, uh, the index of services and the unemployment rate, but we also found that we have forecast gains for the GDP, for the monthly GDP growth. And given the importance of this measure, if we have a look, a closer look on this one, we can see um, so this is um, the ratios of the out of some the root mean square ratios, and we can see that all of our metrics contribute to um, the forecast gains of GDP uh, by including which one of these uh, indicators. So now changing a bit the setup. So now we focus more on the forecasting side. Uh, we try to forecast using a high dimensional feature space, and by High dimensional future space. I will show you what I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm meaning here. So, um, all what I have seen you so far, there are all predefined ways to construct uh, text based measures. However, ideally, we would like to extract as much useful information from the text as possible. So, for that reason, uh, what we do is we create some term frequency matri matrices using all the union of the dictionaries that we have before and some terms up to trigrams. Uh, and by term frequency matrix, I can give you an example to, to understand what I'm talking about. So we basically have a high dimensional space where there are different kind of important words, let's say, with, um, and then we can aggregate them um, on a month. Here I have aggregated them on a monthly frequency. Of course, and basically we can use this matrix as some kind of predictors uh, to, the, to focus the target variables. Of course, um, trying to forecast using uh, this high dimensional future space would not be possible by just doing an OLS uh, as it is subject to the curse of dimensionality. So for that reason, we adopt some machine learning methods techniques that can appropriately handle um, uh, this uh, dimensionality of this matrix. And the models that we use include the lasso, some shrinkage techniques such as the lasso, the elastic net, uh, the ridge regression, uh, partial dimensionality reduction techniques such as partial uh, least squares, um, support vector machines, and random forest. So again, we set up two different forecasting exercises. 
The first exercise is just the benchmark, our benchmark model is again an AR1, uh, whereas the feature-based model is the benchmark mo model including this high dimensional future space. And all this model is estimated by uh, different types of machine learning methods. The second approach that we adopt is to uh, forecast um, using the factor model that we had before, so some lags, uh, the, the lag of the target, pla uh, also, uh, including uh, some macro components. And in that case, we assume that the, the residuals of the, that regression are, um, are driven by, the, by this high dimensional future space. So we estimate the residuals by using this kind of different uh, machine learning methods, and then we use these estimated residuals to forecast the target variable uh, using OLS. And we want to see whether actually this improved forecast for the forecast or not. So the results here, um, so for the first approach where we have the, uh, as the benchmark model, the AR1, what we can see here is uh, the, um, the ratio of, of the out of some root mean square errors um, at a different horizon, so the horizon three, uh, three after three month horizon, six and nine month. But the interesting here is that we actually uh, improve forecast on a wider range of variables. Uh, we also can see that we improve the forecast of some financial indices, uh, uh, financial condition index variable, and the forecast actually um, improves at a longer horizon. So we improve the forecast um, at um, most of the poor forecasts are improved at the horizon um, after after six uh, nine months horizon. Um, here is just. Um, we, we try to check whether actually which one of these machine learning model, models seem to do, seems to uh, improve the forecast best, uh, best the forecast. Um, the, the idea here is that actually all of them contribute to the forecasting gains. Uh, however, the random, for, the random for regression is the one that um, gives us the best results uh, and at the longer horizon. And uh, <clears throat> looking on the second uh, set of the exercises where we estimate the residuals using uh, this high dimensional future space, we can see that we improve the forecast to a wider range of uh, variables. Um, but it's not clear here that uh, as the horizon increases, we also uh, predict uh, better the, 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 the variables. Um, <clears throat> So, um, so to wrap everything up, what we have found so far is that actually text does matter and it seems that it, there exists something in there. Uh, so we found that all of our series seem to be strongly correlated with other soft data that have been used to proxy uh, these kind of notions. Um, we found relative forecast improvements at different um, at uh, different horizons, and the best performance always comes from uh, the real economy variables. We saw that we have Im we improved the focus um, on unemployment, GDP, and uh, inflation. In terms of the best algorithmic best uh, algorithm best metric, uh, it seems that there is no the one that always um, predict the best. However, uh, we saw that even if you just create a simple text metric. Um, you can um, <coughs> you can you can have some forecast improvement. And by including by, by including uh, some more granular in, uh, by extracting some more granular information from text, as we, we've seen with the term frequencies matrices, and using some kind of machine learning methods to forecast the target variable, uh, we achieved forecast improvements for a wider range of variables and for uh, longer horizons. Um, thank you so much. Do you have any questions? <coughs> thank you, Eleni. Uh, any questions uh, on that presentation? Do you have, uh, I'm interested in understanding what the predictive performance you found, 
the tax helps if that is stable over time. If you do have enough sample to figure out if, you know, if you know, 10 years ago would have worked and the same kind of variables, in particularly the machine learning models pick up, would be stable over time or not. I'm just wondering if this is not very specific for the sample period you look at it. Yes, uh, we haven't checked that for, we haven't changed it, the, the sample period. Probably is a very good point uh, to check whether the, the root mean square errors remain stable over time. Yes, thank you. We haven't. Really, a question of clarification. Your first column in the tables of or showing the results of the Diebold Mariano tests was CPI, I think. Were you saying that all the measures had significant improvement in forecasts of CPI, or did I misunderstand your table, please? Um, which one of, of the forecast? Well, you had of two tables which showed you no know, dots for where Diebold Mariano. Yes. The left, the, sorry, the left hand column, I think, was titled CPI, wasn't it? was the p-values of the Diebold and Mariano test, and yes, it was a CPI. And you get, so you get significant improvement with all the indicators for CPI? It gets significant improvements for a wide range of variables. One of the variables was the CPI, yes. But that seemed to have the biggest number of dots. Yes, because we, I had different kind of um, newspapers, so if I show you. Uh, Um, so probably you mean Sorry, it was this that, one. Yes, that one. Yes. Yes, so you're saying that all the sentiment measures, or nearly all of them, improve for the CPI? Yes. Yes, okay, thank you. So actually, the, at least at this horizon, you get on much better with the different indicators at trying to forecast inflation than you do at forecasting yeah, that's correct. unemployment. That's yes. correct. Thank yeah. you. And then? Um, could you also look at, you look at, did you look at errors in the forecast? But it could also be interesting to have more, uh, yeah, some more like something like that. I guess you could look at certain goodness, goodness of bit measures. Mm -hmm. you just look mm -hmm. at mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. correlation, yeah. the input, the output. Because I can imagine that particularly AR1 uh -huh. may basically target very well certain error levels, mm -hmm. um, but probably do not move as good as your sentiment indicators with the actual target variable. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think we, we no, we haven't checked it for uh, uh, for, some, for for some improvements of the guidance of it. Yes, it, it could be potentially a very good point to do that. Yes. Gentleman up there. More for clarification as well. You have these two different approaches. Mm -hmm. um, can you remind me what the, so the first one, you have these extra Z variables, and you have your factors and the AR lags, and you apply the machine learning methods on everything in the first equation? Yes, but so basically, yes. So basically here, we forecast using the machine learning methods, and we just throw everything out and do the forecast. Where the second one, we use the machine learning method only to estimate the residuals. Exactly. It's only on the Zs, and you find the approach two works better. Yeah. Yeah, I guess that probably makes yeah. sense. Okay. Can I ask a question, actually? Um, so I could imagine there are, again, two ways that this might work. One is that newspapers summarize everything that's going on, mm -hmm. uh, and therefore it's just a kind of aggregate measure in some sense. And the other is that it influences the future, mm -hmm. that journalists give their views, they um, break news that was previously unknown. And it would be quite useful to be able to disentangle which of the two is kind of driving things, or maybe both are driving things, but disentangle the different influences. You mean sentiment or sensitivity? Uh, on both, really. Okay. Um, so, so Brexit is a good example. Mm -hmm. The Brexit vote happens, uh, which is known but it was a bit unclear about quite what that would mean in, in various ways. Newspapers both reported what was going on, but also columnists gave views about what would happen, what should happen, mm -hmm. et cetera. And so it might be influencing people's uh, sentiment and might be influencing the level of uncertainty that people perceive. So what I was thinking was the financial markets also operate or can be thought of as aggregators of information. 
So you could compare the uh, financial markets performance about forecasting mm -hmm. various indicators with the newspapers mm -hmm. as a way of understanding the, the aggregation bit and therefore isolate the influential bit the newspapers might be. I'm not sure I made that very clear. Yeah, I'm just uh, thinking how I could, you know, in practice. So I'll, I'll give you an example, the VIX. Yes. yes. I, I think that for anything to predict the VIX is quite amazing. Uh, given how much money goes into that market and how it kind of operates on the basis of everything that might affect uh, U.S. equity prices, which is... You know, well, we anything. basically tried to do that, but it didn't work. Okay. <laughs> we didn't see any uh, influence of our sentiment metrics. On, on, so that's why I, I also uh, have said that we don't really do well on some of the financial indices. Um, yeah, so what I'm saying is not, not that you should be predicting the financial indices, you could use those as well to see if newspapers are adding value over and above financial mm -hmm. measures. Yes, I see. Okay, that's good. We, we didn't do that. Okay. Okay. Um, well, if there are no more questions, I'd like to thank all three of the speakers. Very interesting. Thank you, especially Eleni, who's struggling with her cold. Um, thank you. <laughs>